Slowing Down with the Scriptures, episode 8. We're here live, not so live, from the Purple Couch. Um, and But it's Mother's Day. Quick shout out to the moms. Moms rule. That's all there is to say. Our wives, our moms, we've witnessed, we've witnessed the glory. You deserve every day yep. to be Mother's Day just because you are amazing. Yep. So we're talking about um, a scripture that I think ties in well with Mother's Day uh, that's coming up here on Sunday, and that comes out of Matthew, and it's this, uh, some people probably know this verse from the odd turn of phrase that is found in the King James Version of it. It says, where Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me, which is a... That just sounds bad. It's weird. Yeah, it's a weird sounding phrase. Suffer the children. It would be a great, great name for a heavy metal band. I've always thought that. Suffer the children. Yes. That's That's a great idea. Um, I would play drums. I would play bass. Let's do it. Suffer the children. Coming to you soon. It's, uh, so that's found in the King James. Um, and, uh, but if you look at it in the NIV, it says something a little bit different. And so Jesus is he's walking around, and he's going from like hillside to hillside, and he stops, and he shares some stuff, and he teaches a little bit, and he talks to his friends. That's kind of how he teaches, like rab- yep. rabbinical style. Yeah. Like we're telling stories. We're... we're yep. Object lessons. Yep. On the move. He's looking yeah. for things, objects in nature and people to talk about. And his most of his subject matter is talking about uh, human behavior and how it relates to this mysterious, enigmatic thing that he keeps calling, at least in Matthew he calls it, the kingdom of heaven. And so right in the middle of several of these little interactions, he stops and there's this odd little story where uh, people bring some children Well, let's just read it, in fact. This is Matthew chapter 19, verse 13 through 15. You want me to read? Yeah. Okay. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. Yeah, so... Uh, again, he's he's kind of on the move, and he stops for a moment, and some people bring some children forward. Maybe Jesus was in the middle of speaking, or maybe he had just stopped for a break, but they bring he's some children live forward. Streaming. Yeah, he's li- live streaming one of his uh, messages from the mount, and, um, and the disciples kind of sh- try to shut it down. And it, it seems like what they're asking for him to do is to to lay his hands on them. Now, that it's kind of a strange sounding thing to our modern sensibility, but um, so what was taking place there was probably a, a request for a blessing. Hmm. You know, it'd be kind of like you'd say, can you, can you lay your hand on my child and speak a blessing over him? So this, this would have been, uh, you know, a common practice. Yeah, um, but there's still, I mean, I think you can still, they, they still do that in that culture, right? Yeah. And it goes all the way back to like, I'm thinking about Isaac and right. Jacob, Esau, that whole moment of like laying hands in that blessing. Yeah. It's a big deal. Yeah. And you don't see th- Jesus doing that a lot with people. Like, no, it doesn't seem like it, huh? Um, in the gospel stories, he, you know, he heals people. He talks to people. You don't see him laying hands on people a lot. We talk about it now. If we're going to pray for someone, sometimes we use that language. We we'll say, we're going we're gonna to pray for this person. We're going to lay hands on them, and, which just means... To place your hand on them is it's kind of like a point of human connection um, but Jesus uh, seems to welcome this opportunity mm. to uh, maybe pray over these children or speak a blessing over them and he rebukes his disciples his friends for trying to shut it down I think it's helpful to understand this exchange to to know that this is kind of like a refrain a return to this subject matter he actually uh, talked about it previously in chapter 18 so I thought we could look at that first before we talk about it further. This is Matthew 18, verse 1 through 5. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like, this, like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Okay, so that that part part we just read there, that took place before the other part we read. So clearly Jesus had made this pretty substantial point to the the disciples and used children as a way of 
uh, reinforcing these concepts. And then a few verses later, the disciples had completely forgotten it. And, and you know, mm. and so then here comes these children and they're rebuking these people for bringing them. And, yeah. and so he reminds get them. Get the kids out of here. Yeah, get the kids out of here. And so he reminds them gently. Yeah, hey, remember what I just said? Mm. Um, so there's a few takeaways. This is actually, when you, when you look at this little bundle of phrases that Jesus speaks here, there's kind of a lot. It's pretty complicated, and it, it's a little jarring to our, our uh, maybe overly simplistic way of thinking about heaven and salvation and, and the gospel. Hmm. Um, this thing that he's talking about, the kingdom of heaven, it's really easy for us to take that phrase and just think heaven, like a shiny spiritual city that exists outside of this life or somewhere up in the sky or you know maybe that's where god lives or but but there's mm. there's deeper bigger concepts here than that at work and some of them are complicated so there's a few takeaways i think from this um one is i think if we as we read this and really meditate on what he's saying and what he's not saying it begins to reframe the way we look at all of jesus instructions and it, you begin to see in chapter uh, 18 and 19, you begin to, uh, at least I do, look at this in a new way where he's kind of, he's making this division between when he talks about human behavior and the way people should behave towards one another. He became, it makes this division between the, the, the vulnerable party and the responsible party. So he might, he might be talking about marriage, for example, or he might be talking about um, uh, celibacy or divorce or or friendship mm-hmm. and he pinpoints that in any of these relationships there's there's one party who's vulnerable mm-hmm. who who has less agency less power and he's talking about the responsibility of the person on the other side of the equation what responsibilities do that person have towards the vulnerable party i think this kind of challenges our binary way of thinking about the gospel you know and by that i mean uh you uh, you gave a couple of great messages about this i think late last year where you were talking about how the gospel is more than um how did you say it? that simple way of looking at it where uh it's not just we're bad and i want to go to heaven someday right right and those aren't necessarily like false statements but it's only like a very small part of like this greater, big, beautiful picture yes. of what the gospel is. Right. We were created in the image of God, right? And yeah. to live and dwell with God in our lives. Yeah. And heaven isn't just this place that someday we go and we die. It's actually like Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven being alive and now. Yeah. So, right. right. Yeah. So there's this larger, more complex picture. And. As we embrace that picture, we, we have to set aside kind of our reductionist view of that, where it's just this kind of um, black and white arrangement where we did this, so we get that. Mm-hmm. And as we do that, we're, it, all of these really amazing things open up to us. Um, like, for example, when he's talking about uh, becoming like a child, well, he's not talking about, uh, in my view, taking on additional attributes. He's talking about letting go of attributes that we've mm-hmm. uh, that we've taken on as we've grown older mm. in a world that's full of suffering and darkness and corruption like for example some of these uh, features that you see in human behavior that you don't see as much in ch- in children um, competition the need to compete I mean we talked about how when you read this verse it begins with in verse 1 um, it says at that time the disciples of Jesus asked who is the greatest in the kingdom, right? And this is right. something that they return to again and again. We see this theme in their conversations. Who's the greatest? Who's going to sit at your right hand? Who's the most important? Who do you value the most? Those kind of things. That, that competitive nature of wanting to always find out, am I really better than that other person? Mm. That drive, that need, uh, that's, that's a feature that comes later in life. And, and that's one that he's asking us to let go of. Mm. And then second is uh, the need to be right. That that driving desire to be sh- to be to have my point be proven right and your point being proven wrong. Hmm. I think we see this sometimes. Um, or we're both parents. You know, we see this with our kids. 
you know, you were talking about earlier uh, about playing a game with Kale. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about that, how, like, kids, uh, when you're playing a game with a kid, it isn't always about winning hmm. as a parent. Yeah. It's about playing. Yeah. And it's about being with them. Hmm. And, I mean, I don't think my son's going to watch this, so I can say this, but, like, I often will not try to win, you know, or maybe not play as hard as I would if I was playing you. Right. I want to win. <laughs> yeah. But if I'm playing my son, I'm, I, you know, I want them to have fun. I want to have, it's more about having fun and being together yeah. than it is about winning. Yeah. And oftentimes that's kind of the, the mindset of a child too. Yeah. They just yeah. want, they want to be with you. To live in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was talking with a friend of mine, a little shout out to my friend, uh, Josh Doak, my next door neighbor at, at work. And we were just talking about this very thing, how, you know, as small business guys, we both own small businesses. And uh, one of the skills that you have to acquire in doing that is the the ability to be constantly thinking on the move and problem solving. Like, do I pay this bill today or tomorrow? If I pay that too soon, will I have the the wherewithal to order this thing? Mm -hmm. Do I service this customer first or that one? Which one's most at need? And those are that is a really valuable skill, I think, to yeah. have. And it's taken me a while to acquire it. But another really important skill is the ability to turn it off. Mm. And that's much harder. That's come harder for me. I'm mm -hmm. still learning that one. And what happens is when I come home from work and my children are playing on the floor and they say, Dad, come play with me. Come sit with me. Come slow down. Take time and play this game. The point of which isn't to win at all, but to enjoy. If I do that and... I'm still thinking about those other things. I'm still problem solving in my head and I'm only maybe 30% there. There's joy to be had in that mm -hmm. moment and I'm not partaking in it. Right. Even if they don't know it, right. you're missing it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they I may get not be it. aware. I get yeah. it. I, yeah. yeah. I've had some of those same moments myself where as a kid, it just, it comes so naturally to be in the moment because yeah. they just want to be with us. Right. And, you know, I'm thinking about all the details and the finances and what's, you know, how we're going to reopen church services. And, yeah. And, yeah, kids kids have that ability to shut. Well, they're not even worried about that stuff because no. they're, they're trusting their dads. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even if they sometimes do uh, find themselves concerned about bigger issues... When there's joy to be had in the moment, they partake of it fully. Totally. They don't. They don't want to leave a single bit of it on the on the table. And um, you know, in terms of you know, we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. I, I wonder if sometimes if we we just don't fully appreciate some of the features of what Jesus is talking about in the kingdom of heaven. The idea that if this kingdom is here and it's now, and He's saying you're you're not entering into it, you're not partaking of it. Mm -hmm. If you're not uh, converting and becoming more like a child, maybe joy is one of those things he's talking about that's being left on the table. Hmm. And then another one I was thinking about is the, the reluctance to show vulnerability. You know, when uh, my, my daughter uh, got hurt the other day, she was riding her bike and she crashed. And she, I mean, she just wrecked her elbow. You know, it's all tore up. And she came straight away to me. And showed me, Dad, you know, and showed me her elbow, and big tears were coming down her cheeks. I mean, she just, there was a puddle at our feet. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I embrace her, and we talk, and <clears throat> there's no reluctance to show, but as we grow older, it's interesting how we, we begin to hide our wounds from one another. You know, we say, how are you doing? And we say, I'm, I'm doing good, but we're not good. I'm great, man. Yeah. Good, and, good brother. Yeah. Yeah. I, you were talking about how... Um, one of the really positive things that's come from our community is, is this, um, I think we've kind of fostered a, um, a sense that it's okay to be vulnerable here and to yeah. show that we're not all okay all of the time. There yeah. is hurt and brokenness. Yeah. Yeah. I think more than polished perfection, I think people are hungry for community where you can be real and in order to create that, we have to be willing to be vulnerable ourselves. Yeah. You know, in order to create that for our kids, we got we to gotta be willing to, you know, be vulnerable to lose the game sometimes yeah. or 
sure. lower ourselves and, and let some other things go, to not think about other things. And yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that's true. One of the last things I was thinking about is just the tendency to engage in useless conflicts. And I mean, I don't want to try to adults do that. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I, you know, how could you mean my kids fight? I'm not saying kids don't fight, but when kids fight, there's, there's usually something that they want and they're pretty upfront about that, you know, but, but here's the thing when there's something that they want collectively together, like if I, you know, if I want them to accomplish a task, like, Hey kids, we're going to, we're going to play this game together. But first we got to straighten the room. There is not a single argument about like whose socks are on the floor and who put that toy there. They just work together and they make it happen, you know? And it's interesting how as, as we grow older, this, this tendency towards useless conflict hmm. is, um, is so extreme. I mean, we, we, you look at the world right now, I mean, you have this huge crisis. And you have these two disparate uh, political factions in the United States that just can't even meet in the middle long enough to, uh, you know, pass a law that will help vulnerable people. It's, it's horrible. Right. Yeah, we're probably more divided than ever. And yeah. when it's a time where we need to be unified yeah. and come together and be willing to make ourselves vulnerable for the sake of the vulnerable. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I wonder if it goes back to some of just the other things that you talked about, about just, you know, you talked about the senseless conflict. And I wonder if it ties in with just that need to be right. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes more than being right, it's, it's more important to be, to be. Yeah. And to be loving. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's no room for valuable things like humility when you're yeah. jostling over uh, who's right or wrong, um, you know, about some silly point of contention. Yeah. Where, yeah. Where's, where's the space to be, um, to be humble in that? Yeah. Yeah. So Jesus seems to place this huge premium on those that are vulnerable or in need of protection mm-hmm. and care. In fact, in Matthew eighteen six, he gives this pretty extreme sounding warning about it to emphasize how much he cares about it. He says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. I mean, that's, that's really extreme language, but he's using this hyperbolic kind of word picture to say, I deeply care hmm. about those that are vulnerable and those that are in need those that lack agency and power of their own, and you should too. Hmm. Kind of like what James said about true religion being to care after the orphan and the widow, right? Yeah. The most the most vulnerable. Right. And it's kind of like God, like God made himself vulnerable coming here as a baby, the most vulnerable thing. Like he became a child yeah. so that to be vulnerable so that we could... Uh, you know, to, to find healing and hope and, yeah. and life and, yeah. um, for our sake. Yeah. And we're, we're a lot, I don't think we, we see ourselves as vulnerable, but we're much more vulnerable. I mean, this whole crisis I think shows how vulnerable we, re- we really are. Yeah. Everything that we put our, our, uh, security in can be stripped away pretty quickly. Yeah. And it's funny how like the, the, the answer to find peace and joy in the midst of that isn't being stronger, but mm. it's actually being able to be vulnerable yeah. and, and be like children with God Yeah, to go, okay, I trust God. And so within, and that's, what's cool about kids is they, they trust their parents. And like you were talking about how they can just not miss that moment of joy. Mm-hmm. And I think in the midst of everything we're going on as, as heavy as it is, there's many moments of joy to be had. I've been yeah. finding that with my family. We've been taking um, our lunch and just running down to the beach. Mm. Um, if you stay in the water, you're technically not on the beach. So we just run down and jump in the water for a few minutes and come back and we just play in the water. Yeah. And it's just been so fun being a surfer who is usually, I'm usually serious about the tide and the swell and everything just to play, play in the water with my kids Mm. has been really, it's been really helpful for me in the midst of this. Mm. Um, so 
where are where do you have trouble making yourself vulnerable mm. and uh, where where do you need to become more like a child I know for me I'm thinking about ways that I want to become more childlike and more vulnerable and who are the people around us that are more vulnerable that we can be thinking about and and concerned with yeah yeah maybe we could uh Maybe we could finish by praying about that very thing, just, just that, because I think a lot of these things are these adult behaviors are learned, and um, but the thing about learned behaviors is the difficulty is we have to unlearn them, hmm. you know, and I think that right. we could struggle and wrestle with that on our own strength, but one of the offers that Jesus makes in the kingdom of heaven is that that he'll shoulder some of that that he'll take that, mm. but, but we have to give it to him. So maybe we could pray right now and just ask the Lord to help us with that and that the Holy Spirit would just work in our lives and, and help take some of those things as we offer those to him. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Father, thank you that we can use that word, Father, to refer to, to you, Almighty God, and that you invite us to be your children. And to return to that innocence and that childlike wonder, that childlike faith, and to take to find joy in moments with you. And I pray that you would um, just extend that invitation to everyone that's listening here, that we would um, take hold of the kingdom of heaven by becoming like little children and lowering ourselves, making ourselves vulnerable, being willing to be vulnerable, expressing our need for you, God, and also for looking to see what are the needs of those most vulnerable around us and how can we lower ourselves so that we can help and serve those um, as well. Um, Help us to have your eyes, Lord, to see people and the world around us. Help us to be unifiers in the midst of this crisis. Help us to have humility in the way we speak and act towards others and in our relationship with you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for, um, thank you, Lord, just for your heart for, um, for us, Lord, and in the invitation to, to just become like little kids again, Lord, help us to walk in that today. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, you guys. Thanks for uh, sitting in with us another episode of Slowing Down with the Scriptures. We'll see you this Sunday. Uh, we're streaming live at 9 a.m. here in SoCal, right? Yeah. Join us, and don't forget to sign up for a hangout. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks.